let's start our second day of uh, single cell uh, sequencing, uh, introduction to single cell sequencing. Uh, and uh, as uh, on previous day, we have a lot of uh, uh, unanswered questions. I would like to show some video explaining how does uh, single cell uh, sequencing works, uh, work. Uh, and um, so basically it was the first question and the second one was related to uh, pipeline and wet lab uh, process uh, related to spatial transcriptomics. So it will be the second question that uh, we will also touch. So let's start with the uh, general workflow and uh, hardware infrastructure related to a single cell, uh, like droplet-based sequencing. So here you will see this microfluidic system uh, where you have the well-developed channel system. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Oh, sorry. It was my mistake. So here you can see that uh, suspension, co which contains this uh, uh, very good diluted uh, <coughs> cell uh, solution, is uh, water-based. Here you will see another uh, oil-based channels. And uh, by this incorporation, on the next uh, part you will see it better, uh, you can see how does uh, single cells with uh, bits uh, come together in one droplet. So basically, because of this high dilution, dilution and uh, uh, opportunity to mm, use this uh, uh, physical chemical, uh, phys physical loss of uh, uh, social interaction, we can encapsulate our cells in, with uh, separated bits in uh, each uh, droplet. And here you can see it better that these uh, small bits are moving from two different channels. And uh, by this, we have this high throughput uh, processing of uh, single cell encapsulation. This technology is relatively old. Uh, it was, it's uh, like five or seven years old uh, approach and nowadays it's well optimized because uh, here you can already see that a lot of uh, cells uh, are uh, encapsulated with uh, low quality. It means that uh, some cells are separated and uh, some bits are alone or there are several uh, double cells in one uh, droplet so it should be, should not be so high. My name is Nuro, and I'm the technical application and, uh, specialist here for Dolomite Play. Uh, these, uh, Today, I will be talking video about a product idea, called uh, Noida, system which from, enables uh, high throughput bio, single cell transcriptomic uh, profiling uh, of individual cell uh, types and concentration of genes. Noida can generate up to 48,000 uh, barcoded single cell mRNA uh, libraries uh, in microfluidic droplets uh, in approximately 50 minutes. Based on the droplet protocol, Noida encapsulates single cells in microfluidic droplets with DNA barcoded mRNA. The biggest, uh, After cell lysis, mRNA is the captured on the beads uh, different and following reverse that, transcription, uh, in, uh, the results in bead-bound single-cell CNN uh, libraries are uniquely barcoded uh, by cell of origin. Are used, uh, After RT-PCR and sequencing, general, uh, thousands uh, of single uh, cells may be profiled so based on their transcriptome. Now you take single-cell RNA seq to the next level by using innovation to solve a vast range of industry-wide problems. And so on. Now so, uses cell agitation and I hope this visualization control helps to minimize to cell doublets. Understand how the single sequencing, single cell sequencing works. So it's quite easy. The quality of the transcription is maintained. Of course, a lot of uh, hidden uh, stuff are covered uh, below. Uh, yep. So, do we have any questions about single cell? How the single cell works? Not yet. Excellent. So the second question was related to spatial transcriptomics, and here is the promotion video of Tamex Genomics Visium system. And uh, on this video, uh, they explain how does it work. So basically, the issue is that okay, sorry, I cannot turn on this. So what do we do? The first step of, uh, okay, let's pause it. Uh, so the first step, uh, which is uh, obligatory for spatial single cell uh, sequencing is this slice preparation. It could be, it should be micron uh, thin uh, slices, uh, which you will dissect from your uh, target tissue and then put to this uh, specific uh, uh, glass. And 
on this step, you already see that it's a substantial difference uh, comparable to droplet-based sequencing for like general single cell uh, technologies because in single cell we do uh, the first uh, preliminary uh, <coughs> stage tissue di digestion and uh, <coughs> disso dissociation. And here we, our main task is uh, keep these cell-cell uh, interaction, cell position and uh, tissue uh, slice as well. So you do dissection and then put it into a specific uh, prepared glass, do tissue fixation. <coughs> and uh, in ideal situation, each bit corresponds to each cell, but um, in this system it's not so, but uh, in general it's like desired situation and because it's uh, uh, not bit, uh, sorry, bit or puck, this uh, spot with uh, uh, immobilized bits uh, corresponds to each cells, and uh, by putting uh, this uh, fixed tissue on this uh, specific immobilized bit uh, bits, you do on this uh, step uh, river uh, RT PCR uh, and uh, convert. Uh, oh, sorry, not PCR. Uh, convert to mRNA to uh, DNA on this step, and because these already have not a cell barcode but a spatial barcode you can then uh, after ngs identify this barcode and its position uh, by uh, matching uh, them like with this uh, tissue sample so probably what's going on uh, so definitely uh, it's uh, quite more complicated than single uh, than regular single cell uh, sequencing uh, approach because uh, here you, you should keep this uh, tissue structure uh, however it allows you to understand the spatial position and the interaction of some uh, cells uh, inside um, tissue uh, on single cell resolution <coughs> so uh, the similar sample preparation related to tissue fixation and, and permeabilization uh, imaging of this uh, uh, a tissue sample imaging could be done by uh, hematoxylin eosin staining or a lot of, or uh, preparation of uh, fluorescent label uh, dyes. Uh, then uh, you do spatial sequencing, like with uh, which consists, which is focused on library construction and barcoding. The, you, then you do uh, regular uh, NGS and then downstream uh, like further analysis. Uh, as I said. Uh, the biggest difference is that here you have spatial barcode instead of regular barcode and basically it's not so high throughput so you cannot all analyze so many cells uh, but uh, uh, you analyze just some specific uh, small amount of cells but uh, uh, remaining their uh, spatial position uh, okay this is the second video from tanex of wisdom system Abbreviation of uh, HMV means uh, uh, high uh, molecular weight uh, genome DNA, which you prepare on previous stages of uh, uh, doing a reverse transcription of your sample by uh, capturing mRNA and converting them to your DNA uh, on the place in situ. tool from Tanex Genomics is like a sequencing system mm -hmm. so it's just another approach of single cell technologies like a set oh yeah sorry I didn't tell uh, uh, some it's just like one of the products of a Tanex Genomics company so it's a uh, commercial available uh, yeah yeah
it will give you some general uh, yeah, understanding of how does uh, uh, single cell as well as uh, spatial single cell technology uh, work. Uh, and uh, one of the, uh, not a fundamental, but one of the key uh, publications related to spatial transcriptomics using uh, 10x uh, uh, resume system is this one, visualization and analysis gene expression in tissue sections uh, by spatial transcriptomics. This paper is from 2018. Uh, it's uh, on this uh, 10x, chromium, uh, 10x uh, genomics website. You can easily uh, download it, as I remember. I'm not so sure that it's uh, open access, but uh, yeah, it's possible to somehow fish it. So probably uh, in this publication, they explain how does it work, how uh, uh, it could be done with uh, tissue uh, sections and uh, all of the steps with examples of, for example, this is a sample of uh, hematoxylin eosine uh, staining and uh, um, visualization of sample using uh, specific uh, fluorescent dyes because it's necessary to do this microscopy and imaging of your sample before. And um, this people as well described this uh, particular aspects of uh, spatial transcriptomics, like on the real case. The next one is uh, here, how does this sample look like? For example, uh, here you can see that specific uh, cell types and cell clusters uh, using marker genes were uh, visualized by different colors. And uh, even using this uh, spatial transcriptomic sequencing, it's possible to identify like uh, specific zones and uh, uh, sections of the tissue which are uh, which correlates with different clusters as we see the gaps between different spots that we analyze and basically in these spots which are colored you do this single cell sequencing they are quite far from each other and it's not the ideal situation that we can uh, uh, run this and uh, uh, like of course it's much better to have a better and more informative system but uh, like 10x uh, vision uh, system is one of the most popular and the one commercially available tools. So that's the point that uh, most of uh, scientific paper which uh, describes some spatial transcriptomic st stuff are based on this um, systems. Uh, however, as we discussed yesterday, uh, nowadays uh, there is a um, hype and big uh, wave of development of uh, alternative uh, single cell, uh, spatial single cell uh, sequencing technology which are much more high throughput. For example, they have better coverage or uh, another uh, auxiliary features, but of course they have uh, as well their own disadvantages. As you remember from yesterday with Merfish, you have to operate with um, powerful microscopy system and also um, using like, uh, and also validate other uh, very prominent tools which are just developed. So it's a very perspective direction of research and I am pretty sure that in the next one, two years uh, the system will be updated and uh, like better uh, to, to use and you will have much more representative uh, picture of your sample. But at least you can easily identify marker genes and of course it is a single cell experiment you can have, uh, uh, okay, uh, you can have uh, different uh, not the pictures, but uh, representation of a lot of other genes uh, in your sample and do this visualization and uh, cluster annotation. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, of course, if you have some experience in the wet lab, you will definitely say that comparing to immunostaining, this is not so representative, but just remember that immunostaining, you just look at some particular cases and particular markers and uh, do uh, their analysis. But from there, uh, you have this high throughput, like high dimensional uh, representation of your tissue samples. So uh, usually spatial transcriptomics uh, not uh, uh, correlates, but uh, as here you can see this uh, um, 
uh, pictures from uh, Alan, uh, Brain Atlas uh, this uh, match these uh, results with general single cell spatial transcriptomics with uh, in situ hybridization of uh, these markers and it's like pretty similar but of course it's, it needs uh, some uh, improvement so uh, let's move to applied cases that I would like to discuss today. Um, these applied cases of applications in single cell technologies are divided, I would like to divide them in these like fundamental science, biomedicine, and I will briefly introduce you what uh, do I do in my uh, scientific research in uh, my master's projects. So uh, in fundamental science, one of the most hot spots are developmental biology and other multiple aspects of general biology from cell uh, biology like zoology uh, plant science like almost anything and of course for applied purposes you need uh, corrections or some links with biomedicine as well as drug development uh, and diagnostics so in this uh, part I will uh, try to explain basic uh, aspects of uh, publications which are fundamental in single cell research and the first one is related to fundamental science, and it's the single cell transcriptomic landscape of mammalian organogenesis. It's really very powerful, I would like to say, publications. A publication, uh, and here what uh, they've done is they analyzed 2 million of cells from uh, 61 mouse embryos between uh, 9.5 and 3.5 days of gestation. It's quite substantial. Mm, this, like comparing for uh, with the uh, human development, it's almost nothing. But as mouse develop in uh, mouse embryo develops in 21 day uh, days, it's quite a big period of time in embryogenesis. And um, basically, what uh, they've done is uh, they do single cell analysis of these two million cells. So you can imagine how powerful should, could, should be your computer infrastructure to do this uh, processing and so on. And what they analyzed, they analyzed specific uh, cluster of cells which appears in specific time points and also uh, like by identifying my major cell types of uh, mouse organogenesis uh, as well as identifying uh, separated cell lines. And for all of these cell lines, uh, they do this uh, pseudo-time uh, ordering and uh, explain when and how uh, each line, uh, cell line appears and uh, which progenitors are used and so on and so forth. For, so it means that uh, for almost any um, cell lines which is described in this publication, they uh, build this trajectory and you can go further. It has way too much uh, supplementary information. It's very uh, exciting uh, for a developmental biologist uh, to track and to understand better all of these uh, processes in such a single cell and su such lower uh, resolution and uh, higher resolution, lower scaling. Um, and uh, yeah, so what they done, um, they described the cell lines uh, and uh, did uh, this, uh, sorry for this, Part. Uh, so they described these uh, clusters as well uh, with uh, uh, visualization data. So based on these uh, data sets, they did uh, uh, they developed such a resource called Mouse or Organogenesis Cell Atlas, and I highly recommend you to surf on this pretty website because it's uh, fancy and you will definitely fish some interesting uh, insight from there and at least uh, understand how can you implement, visualize, and interact with your single cell data. It's a very pretty nice case. It's fundamental work and yeah, become familiar is first, uh, yeah, it's very important. Uh, so here, even they, for promotion, their research, quite good marketing point for, for scientists, they developed this video. Uh, okay, I didn't say, uh, tell you that uh, today we will have almost seven videos. So today we'll uh, watch a lot of cartoons because, yeah, don't to make you tired or make you more entertained. Uh, yeah, so I think it's third video, and here we have mm, mouse organogenesis. Mammalian oh. organogenesis is an astonishing oh, process. Within a short window, the cells of the three germ layers transform into an embryo. In our current study, 
we investigated how different cell types emerge during mouse organogenesis using a method called single-cell combinatorial indexing. Uh, yep, and here they also use First, the we isolate the cells of individual embryos at five time points of mouse development and distribute them to different wells of a microtiter plate. We also extract, fix, and permeabilize the nuclei of each embryo such that enzymes can move in and out of the intact nuclei. cDNA is synthesized and a molecular barcode is introduced. For example, uh, the first regular single-cell experience uh, could be done with uh, fresh tissue samples. For fixed tissue samples, it's almost impossible to do single-cell stuff and to make such kind of alternative, it's possible to do single nuclei sequencing, which uh, gives you in information about RNA which are captured in, uh, in, uh, inside the nucleus lamina. It means that if you are going to analyze the mRNA, cytoplasmic mRNA in uh, fixed samples, it will be almost impossible because it will be degraded sometimes, even if it's a paraffin fixed uh, samples. Uh, yeah, formal embedded, something like this. Uh, okay, so uh, here they do. Uh, they did First this molecular uh, barcode identifies the embryo that each nucleus came from. So they we then pool and mix all of the nuclei and randomly the distribute them to wells this, of a new uh, microtiter plate, RNA? where the cDNA molecules receive a second barcode. We pool and mix the nuclei again and randomly distribute them to yet another microtiter plate where the molecules receive a third barcode during PCR amplification. This presentation because each be nucleus traverses a unique combination we of three wells, its molecules are tagged with a unique combination of three and barcodes. And, yeah, surf, uh, here. Over 10 billion uh, RNA-derived molecules more sequencing. The sequence reads are computationally uh, yeah, grouped with unique combinations of the three uh, barcodes identifying cell. groups of reads that came from the same cell. Uh, starting this point from, uh, Patterns of uh, gene expression are used to identify hundreds of cell types, work, essentially uh, digital representations of the molecular composition of each of the data, two million so single just, cells. I would like to say, uh, we know to which embryo each cell to, came from. Kind of imagination of this, uh, we can also order of cells of each type in developmental time, so, creating digital uh, representations of how each cell Cell type develops number, and its gene and expression changes and during mammalian organogenesis. Should be pre to obtain this number of, Thanks for watching. Uh, of, uh, Please see the manuscript data. and website so, for more details. Yep. And of course, as it's a bioinformatics data set, it's open access. So probably if you have such capacity to analyze it, you can have fun with it. And we now we are moving forward and switch to apply it. Uh, apply it. Uh, cases of uh, single cell uh, single cell science and here i would like to discuss the single cell genomics approaches for developing the next generation of immunotherapies it's uh, as i remember yeah it's perspective so it means that it doesn't have um, wet lab work so it describes just general features of uh, and possibilities of implementation single cell uh, uh, single cell approaches in uh, biomedicine and here what they've done is uh, uh not they done what they described is that uh in general uh, the, the biggest challenge of uh, immunotherapy is to do so is to convert immunosuppressive uh, tumor phenotype to uh, immunosuppressive phenotype to active immune response but it's not about tumor it's about a tumor microenvironment so the biggest idea of uh and the biggest aim of uh, efficient immunotherapy is uh, mostly uh, treat uh, tumor, not by targeting directly tumor, but changing its uh, surroundings. It means tumor microenvironment. And they, they describe uh, that it's clear that um, by operating such precise tools like single cell sequencing, it's possible to do this uh, because you have such imagination of cell types, cell states, and subtypes of cells uh, which, are, uh, which are presented in particular samples. And here they describe how it's possible to do. For example, you can apply this uh, for analyzing patient tumor samples by identifying different uh, cell types and so on. However, it's possible and it's like one of the hottest spots to apply single cell for xenografts. It's a, a specific type of xenotransplantation where you 
have uh, this sample from a human and you do the transplantation into a model system organisms such as mouse to uh, look at this uh, pro progression and so on. Because for tumor personalized therapy, it's also one of the possible way to mm, touch this question, to solve this question, uh, as well as uh, comparing that for with other uh, model development where you do some gene editing or a general uh, overview of uh, like general deeper observation of model systems uh, related to a specific uh, cancer therapy uh, immunotherapy uh, system so uh, here what can we do we can uh, by analyze different uh, treatment conditions as well as general uh, initial uh, samples using single cell technology and analyze uh, its uh, profiles, which uh, yeah, which you can uh, obtain from um, further single cell sequencing processing. Uh, so the points when where you can apply it is to un understand better uh, protein level, uh, cell cell interaction, uh, do this data imputation for producing such uh, cellular interaction networks and also uh, signaling, track signaling events, and so on and so forth. So uh, to summarize it, uh, single cell technology is a very prominent tool to uh, go deeper and be much precise in um, uh, such cases as cancer treatment by immunotherapy. However, uh, it's quite, in this perspective uh, paper, it's uh, written also that it's uh, single cell technologies could be also easily applied to uh, improving a clinical program and uh, clinical trials uh, by uh, implementing single cell and having better understanding of disease processes. Uh, so uh, it's mostly related to enhancing clinical uh, data to understand uh, samples, disease, and mesh this data to track this uh, um, these changes uh, after specific therapies and so on and so forth. So, uh, as was described before, we can compare a single cell uh, scale, a single cell data from different treatment conditions or disease stages or different patients and understand, for example, which uh, cells, which group of cells, cell cluster is the target of such uh, event uh, and uh, which could be, which, is, which one is the key point of uh, successful treatment and so on and so forth. So even right now, this uh, idea to transfer uh, the single cell tools to uh, clinical trials is also became, becoming much more much popular and uh, so on and so forth. However, one week ago, I think we have such journal club where we discussed this single cell pathology landscape of breast cancer. And if you did not see that, I highly recommend maybe to spend some time, maybe if you will be cooking something to turn on and watch this or listen. Uh, yep. Uh, anyway, uh, and here uh, we discussed uh, also another applied tools in biomedicine to uh, go deeper in single cell and even subcellular resolution of uh, disease understanding. Uh, using the case of breast cancer. Uh, cancer. Uh, so basically, uh, even almost every two days, uh, very interesting paper related to biomedicine using uh, single cell tools uh, comes into uh, scientific publication. So it's very interesting to track these changes and be uh, up, uh, keep being updated. So yeah, it's very prospective stuff. And uh, following other hype, uh, it's possible to apply uh, single cell uh, data stuff to uh, analyzing uh, coronavirus infection. And I will go deeper. I will explain you how. It's very interesting because I knew that it's possible because uh, I, in my research, I was doing some kind of analysis of infections and single cell as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it's quite not challenging, but it's a uh, very uh, new field to apply this single stuff, uh, stuff to infection uh, observation. And here it's very interesting, uh, typical bioinformatics paper which explain how to apply uh, single cell data tools to uh, such uh, hot topic as coronavirus. Uh, so it's, it was posted less than two weeks ago. So it's quite fresh and uh, like next few slides I will go deeper a little bit. But talking about other cases, it's also possible, for example, interesting observation uh, 
was uh, done uh, and published in uh, Nature column. I'm not so sure that it's a Nature paper, but at least they highlighted that uh, it's possible to um, uh, to see some difference and, uh, differences in cell types and cell cluster in in uh, different samples from smokers, non-smokers, and uh, uh, smokers who keep this uh, habit. So even these uh, differences uh, appears, and uh, by a single cell tool, it's possible to track it. But yeah, it's there. But anyway. Uh, of course, uh, comparing for a previous case uh, related to immunotherapy, it's possible to apply single cell transcriptomics for better solid organ transplantation, better outcome, because then you will have better understanding of uh, how does this, uh, how, what are the, what, in, what is inside of uh, organs and how uh, this uh, cell uh, not appears but uh, interact and like from by capturing and analyzing set of data, you can build some prediction. Is it uh, organ transplant good in, uh, enough and uh, uh, suitable for a specific patient? And uh, of course, it will sh uh, solve some problems of uh, incompatibility of uh, transplants and so on. So, uh, and we, as we understand uh, from here, it's also uh, quite uh, suitable to apply spatial transcriptomic sequencing to better understanding and a lot of other work related to uh, cancer observation by single cell tools uh, are presented in, uh, yeah, in scientific publications. So going back to coronavirus, uh, as we know, maybe who already become familiar with, became familiar with uh, coronavirus uh, papers that one of the key uh, agent is this cell receptor of angiotensin. Uh, converting enzyme to type 2 uh, and uh, in this single cell paper what did they does uh, what did, what they've done is uh, they just capture uh, not just okay they capture <laughs> sorry I, I would have not done this uh, so they capture different single cell data set of uh, um, different uh, human body parts and the interesting point that they start uh, from the uh, such a statement that it's well known that uh, Coronavirus is transmitted by uh, breathing tract, by breathing, so the first, by inhalation. Uh, so the first uh, key target is this uh, breathing system, but uh, also it's possible to do this, uh, to do this virus transmission using, uh, not using, but by uh, foodborne uh, stuff, like, uh, yeah, but by common, uh, plates and so on, like another, uh, another type of uh, transmission. And uh, here they started analyzing how can this uh, virus uh, be, uh, uh, how ca can this virus like probably interact with specific uh, parts of a digestive system. And here they captured, sorry for low quality of image, so, but here they captured the different single cell data set of healthy uh, part of organs uh, from uh, patients. Sorry. It's, I suppose the image that I would like to show it's uh, on, on, the, on the background, so it's not hidden. But anyway, here you can see this uh, overall processing of single cell data set from different digestive or from different organ from organs from digestive system. And what did they do? They plot. This uh, it's a feature plot of IC2 uh, gene uh, inside this data, and they just hypothesize that, for example, in such uh, uh, groups of uh, organs, this virus could be easily absorbed. So, honestly, what does it show? It shows that it's possible to it not as possible, but it's almost obligatory to not uh, go deeper just in. Um, um, breathing system into lungs, but uh, also uh, to a specific parts of digestive system. But as I said, it's typical uh, bioinformatics work and it's quite interesting that, yeah, they uh, using uh, not single cell uh, sequencing uh, at all, but uh, seeing results of the sequencing of absolutely other data sets, they can uh, do such predictions. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, from this one, we will uh, move to my project. 
uh, and it means that it's almost bigger half of uh, today's lecture is uh, over. And uh, what I do, uh, I analyze a um, single cell data set from uh, 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 human brain organoids, and we will sli slightly move there uh, by uh, discussing another cases because uh, single cell transcriptomics is uh, well applied for such neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer, Parkinson, and so on and so forth. And um, by analyzing these data sets, which are also in my uh, area of view, uh, we can uh, do this comparison and uh, obtain better understanding of this disease and uh, this disease modeling in other uh, model system as uh, human brain organoids. So, uh, the starting point is that uh, organoids, I will show you later on the video what's organoids, uh, what are organized and how can we uh, operate with them. But the initial point is that <clears throat> this model system is uh, alternative and better alternative for uh, cell culture uh, <clears throat> that uh, are used to model uh, neurodevelopmental processes uh, in vitro. So basically, it was shown this year, like in 2019, uh, that uh, these uh, organoids recapitulate main features of human brain development and uh, allow, uh, allow scientists to understand better how does the brain develops uh, in artificial condition and uh, probably in, uh, in vivo conditions. Uh, several, uh, there are not so many papers of human brain organoids, especially in single cell, but uh, still uh, they show that it's possible to do such kind of recapitulation of uh, brain development in vitro. And uh, a single cell, especially spatial single cell technology, is one of the best tools and one of the best, most precise tools to track this uh, matching and do such iterative uh, improvement uh, of these uh, models to make this better recapitulation of uh, human brain um, in vitro. However, <clears throat> this paper published recently uh, showed that uh, there is a very big mismatch of this uh, recapitulation. And honestly, I'm, uh, from my one point of view, I'm proud that I was working in absolutely the same, same cases and doing absolutely the same uh, described in these publications <laughs> because they compared given data sets from already published uh, papers uh, of human brain organoids comparing different wet lab protocols and sequencing technologies and so on. Um, but in general, these papers show that still human brain organoids uh, I will show you one mom moment, no, uh, are quite far for, from uh, ideal situation. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, basically in that paper, they compared these uh, typical genes of uh, in vivo samples from um, human brain samples. And we have this very low match of uh, correlated genes. So it means that from one point of view, human brain organoids in general by identifying cell types can do this uh, recapitulation, particular recapitulation, but still it's so far from the ideal recapitulation of human brain uh, in vitro, and it should be uh, improved. So going back uh, to and answering the question, uh, who are organoids and how they develop, I want to show you this video. This Maybe pencil eraser sized mass of cells uh, is something called a brain organoid. IPCs, it's a collection uh, of lab grown in neurons still, uh, and other brain tissue cells, uh, that scientists culture. can use and to learn about full grown human brains. But after and it can that, be grown um, from a sample of your skin cells. Yeah, uh, of course it could Why be would we need such a thing? It, uh, Neuroscientists cells, face a challenge. Uh, Shielded by our thick skulls and swaddled in layers of protective then, tissue, the human brain is extremely difficult to observe in action. Using this For centuries, scientists have tried to understand them using autopsies, animal models, and in recent years, imaging techniques. We've learned a lot through all these methods, Before, but they uh, have using, limitations. Uh, Conditions model, like Alzheimer's and yeah, schizophrenia and the effect on the human brain watches, of diseases uh, like Zika continue to hide beyond and, our view uh, and our understanding. Uh, Enter brain organoids, brain? which function but like now, human brains but aren't part of an organism. So Each one comes from an undifferentiated stem cell, which is a cell that can develop into any tissue uh, in the body. So yeah, basically the idea that uh, 
I want to show the pipeline. I don't remember where is it. Okay, but I think it's in the other video. So what are you are doing is uh, you have this uh, primary... This protocol uh, will demonstrate for, how to grow uh, cerebral culture. organoids. The protocol for generating cerebral organoids using the STEM diff cerebral organoid kit has four stages. Embryoid body. Let's stop on this slide. So, what do you do? You uh, uh, cultivate your uh, culture, do regular pathogen. Then, next step is embryonic body formation. Uh, you uh, try to by uh, several steps like centrifugations and uh, uh, specific. Uh, coating martigel or other uh, polymers, you try to obtain this uh, aggregated uh, ball of, uh, prime, uh, of uh, cells from your uh, monolayer culture. And then you try to do some kind of induction of this organoids by providing some um, specific uh, triggers, biochemical triggers, and try to promote this uh, neuro neuronal type line uh, development uh, in vitro. And probably it's possible to uh, keep your organoids till 90 or even 180 days. Uh, and then you will body formation, have such induction, expansion, and organoid anyway, maturation. To track this uh, so here you can see this this protocol is meant to be used uh, with high quality human pluripotent uh, stem cells that exhibit distinct borders, tight packing and less than 10% differentiation with respect to their colony surface area. Stage 1. Embryoid body formation. Begin this protocol by preparing EB formation medium. Rinse HPSC cultures with PBS. Aspirate and replace with gentle cell dissociation reagent. Incubate for 8 to 10 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius. Transfer cells to a 50 milliliter conical tube. Prepare EB seeding medium by supplementing the EB formation medium with 10 microliters of Y27632 rock inhibitor. Rinse the well with EB seeding medium. Okay. Uh, and then uh, you have this uh, well-formed uh, uh, sphere-shaped uh, uh, embryonic body and then uh, organoids that you can uh, even uh, go two ways. First of all, you, have, you can uh, just do nothing and keep it in a culture medium with regular uh, content. Uh, like, uh, yeah, uh, anyway. Uh, and see some kind of cerebral uh, cerebral organoids which are not well patterned and so on, but then by providing specific uh, triggers, biochemical triggers, you can do such kind of pattern and uh, uh, see uh, specific uh, brain areas organoids like hypothalamus, uh, midbrain, and so on and so forth. I think the really mind-changing technology and aspect of this stuff is to receive assemblies. On the next slide, we will see. So yeah, it's possible to obtain four brain organoids, three brain organoids, and, and a lot of another uh, a lot of other protocols are well de are well developed. Uh, however, we understand that first of all, these organoids completely do not recapitulate this structure. But it's also uh, interesting to merge these organoids into specific um, assembloid stuff and uh, analyze their interaction, like. Uh, regular uh, types or uh, lawyers of, or parts of human brain interact in the real systems. So, yeah, I, uh, I like this picture, but it's, I think it's quite fine. It's like super thinking about your human brain organs. But anyway, let's uh, discuss uh, other stuff. So, uh, by obtaining these cortical organoids and comparing them by, uh, with the human embryonic cortex, it's possible to see uh, quite similar cell types which appear almost in correlated time points and you definitely can track this uh, changing and do this comparison but yeah uh, the idea is uh, that this technology is very prospective but you have to improve it and uh, however even right now it's possible to do this comparison and uh, even try 
uh, even start doing some disease models for neurodevelopmental disorders and so on, uh, being on this stage. So, uh, by uh, merging and by assembling different pattern organoids, you can have these assembloids. And I think it's a very, like, it's a super fantastic uh, technology. And uh, I'm really looking forward for, uh, to analyzing the year data set because it's, it will be, I think it's a very pool of insight that you can uh, find there. Uh, yep. So, uh, in uh, organoids, uh, as I said, uh, there are two uh, biggest uh, problems or limitation. First one is that by this recent publication, it's clear that they don't completely recapitulate this uh, brain development. Uh, and yeah, yeah right, right now, now it is so. so. And even because of diversity of uh, human brain organized pro protocols, we can see it by comparing this data. Uh, but the second and third problem yeah, here probably this, uh, here is this uh, picture of that publication. We see that uh, by uh, primary clusters from um, embryonic or fetal brain and uh, organized clusters, we don't have such uh, correlation at all. We have such particular cluster that we can match by marker genes, but anyway, there is no, you know, uh, distinct border or diagonal that we can assign and say that uh, the recapitulation is uh, complete in advance. But anyway, we can uh, find different cell types which appears in organoids in different stages under different protocols. And it's a real success because anyway, this technology becomes uh, popular not so long time ago, less than five years. So it's very nice results, I would like to say. Problem two and three are related to, first of all, necrotic core and lack of vascularization. We understand that this growth of uh, embryonic uh, body and then in uh, organoids is limited because of uh, incorporation and uh, administration of nutrients and oxygen inside these organoids. And it promotes such problems that inside these organoids, necrotic core of dying cells appears, and you can easily see it in, on immunostaining images or even in your single cell data set, which is full of broken cells or uh, dying cells. You have this um, high expression of uh, apoptotic genes uh, and so on and so forth. But the second pro problem is lack of vascularization because we understand that uh, we just do a derivation of uh, mm, in the IPC's line to neural uh, cell line type, uh, but we do not incorporate a mesodermal line, like which will give you some kind of, uh, like with other uh, germ, germ lawyers, which will give you such uh, vascularization uh, picture. Uh, but even uh, for these purposes, for this uh, surf problem, uh, there is a one a very fancy publication that tried to uh, solve this uh, limitation and this solution I think it's yeah it's quite interesting so what did they do is this is this paper uh, they tried to uh, obtain this vascular like system inside human brain organoids and the first point is that um, okay uh, they uh, do gene editing of uh, experimental group uh, of uh, experimental culture of this brain organoids uh, they incorporated a uh, ETV2 gene that uh, uh, is uh, which is uh, occupied in this uh, vascularization development, and basically uh, they see these um, differences in, uh, for example, uh, it's a vascularized uh, human or, uh, cortical organoids and non-vascularized, and we see these uh, differences in cell clusters and uh, the uh, gene ontology term, or like, okay, metabolic profiles already, and even these small changes, uh, changes uh, of uh, incorporation of gene engineering tools uh, can uh, give us better results and solve the problem of uh, vascularization. But still, there is a lot of work which should be done to receive a better outcome. Uh, also, other group of scientists that I have uh, uh, that I have uh, luck to communicate uh, is uh, a scientist from Kulovan, and what they did is they tried to build a artificial vascularization system, which is. Uh, which is operates with uh, nano vessels, nano uh, microcapillaries, and try to do this administration of nutrients inside a 
by this artificial vascular like system. So uh, also it's, I think it's fantastic, honestly. However, in this paper, uh, what they do next is uh, uh, these obtained organoids, then they transplanted to uh, mice uh, and tried to observe this vascularization in real organoids, uh, in real organisms. So even by this step, they see that the vascularization in the real system is much better because uh, in this uh, vascularized human organoids, the vascular system development it was much better than in control group. So uh, honestly, uh, before reading this paper, I was not expecting so, uh, such outcomes. I was not even thinking that it's possible to do uh, such uh, improvement, but I think it's very interesting. Okay, so a brief summary about human brain organism that the diversity of different wet lab protocols is substantial and uh, the outcome and this is just the diversity of wet lab protocols. I was analyzing the uh, data sets of uh, different sequencing technology and by incorporating the sequencing uh, biases it's also very diff uh, difficult to uh, fish the similarities and do this matching. So uh, right now it's almost impossible to do uh, uh, Meta, not a meta-analysis, but summarized a representation of a single cell human brain organoids profile, and we should go deeper in each case. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, work, um, there is a lot of work which was done to come closer to this uh, understanding, and of course, uh, in the nearest future, it will be uh, improved, I'm pretty sure. However, it's almost impossible to do this without single cell because uh, in this case, you can track this difference very precise. Ha however, from the second time, you, it's will be, it will be much better to apply uh, spatial single, single cell sequencing to have better imagination about uh, not just the appearance or like number of cells uh, related to specific cell cluster, but mostly for the localization and interaction, cell context and so on and so forth. Because it's also very important to uh, track, uh, to track these uh, changes in the cellular and uh, subcellular uh, levels. Second summer, summary is that we finished our uh, single cell introduction course. Uh, and uh, as you already know uh, a little bit more about single cell, I hope you will be inspired enough to start your tutorial in Serat or something like this <laughs> and try to uh, play with these single cell data and single cell tools. And if you will need some help, a lot of people ask who I am, but I will ask where I am, <laughs> not ask, okay, I'll tell. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or uh, uh, Telegram. Please don't write me on Facebook. I don't like Facebook. <laughs> 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 Anti interesting. <laughs> okay, so I think it's a question time. I hope that you are still with me. So, questions? <laughs> 